Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Appreciate your, your kindness and prayers this week. It's been physically a bit of a battle, but uh, we're getting there, and I appreciate the concern that many of you have shown, the questions you've asked. It's good to see you tonight. It's lovely. And uh, part of the reason you're getting me again is because all the other team are pretty busy on other stuff, so I'm the least busy on other stuff but also because I want to talk to you. And um, <coughs> a few years ago, I want to talk to you about dreams, influence, and inspiration. Um, <coughs> a few years ago, I received a letter uh, from a young man in this, in this house. Um, and it contained a very moving message. And um, in, in the envelope, there was a box of Rizla cigarette papers and uh, a pack of tobacco and uh, the thing that humbled me the most uh, were these few words that were written in there. Thank you for being an inspiration. What does that mean and what is its significance, being an inspiration? I want to wrestle with that and this will be a two-part message, so you've got me again next week. Um, because I, can't, because I can't finish this tonight. Part of the reason being that I want to share my time um, by playing a 15-minute video for you, which I think is interesting, especially interesting for you guys and anybody who, who was born 1994 or later. Put your hand up if you were born after 1994. Okay, well, this, this video is talking specifically and particularly about about you. Now, I've got one Bible verse because we're in church and I don't want anybody to say we didn't have a Bible verse, so that wasn't a proper church meeting, was it? So I have one, okay? This is a real one, I didn't make this up. Luke 7, verse 35 says this But wisdom is justified by her children. What that means is this that you can tell wisdom by what it produces. And whatever it produces will tell you whether it was really wisdom. And so I think tonight we're going to share some wisdom that will be justified by its children. I want to share some wisdom, hopefully from my own life, but also some wisdom from uh, what is this, this video that is not particularly a Christian video in the sense of we like to tag things, but it's every bit a Christian video because it's talking wisdom and sense about life and particularly about a generation. But before I do that, I want to talk to the older people in here. Uh, because the video is very directed towards young people, but you need to pay attention as well, because this is part of our challenge. I've noticed that the problem with age is that somewhere in the process of life, something or someone woke us up from our dream. And suddenly, however it happened, we realized that we no longer had a dream. And reality and pragmatism took over where passion and purpose once made us blind to certainty and impossibility. And I've been there, I'm saying this because, you know, I know I look like 30, but I'm actually 60. And that's okay, you can say, Anthony, you look absolutely amazing. Thank you, you're very welcome. Um, I know this to be true in my own life because, and I think, I think those who are a little older will, will get this, the more you live life, reality and pragmatism start to take over where passion and purpose once made you blind to certainty and impossibility. And uh, the problem is then we stop dreaming and just carry on. We just do what we do and we live how we live and we do our parenting and we do our grandparenting and we go to the shops and we do our job and, and, and somehow in there, this, this passion, this purpose of a dream, this driving thing died somewhere and we, we start going 
through the motions. We just carry on living. And I've had to ask myself the question, has, have I, over recent years, on the journey that I have encountered, because of the realities of some of those things, lost the dream that I once had, that gave me the passion that I carried, that, that, that actually allowed me to be who I was supposed to be. And I don't ask that question just of me, but of every person who's got a few years on their back. Because I want us all to dream again. Or at least if you can't do that, embrace the dream of another. Now, for those who can't dream anymore, we need those who can. And um, uh, my longevity is much more greatly compromised now than it was when I first took over the leadership of this house 25 years ago. And um, uh, I will not live forever and I will not and should not be the leader of this house forever. There will come a point of transition. But I don't want to give it to a 55, 65 year old person because that would be counterproductive. It needs to go to where dreams thrive the best and dreams thrive the best in youth. So I need you young people, I need you guys. You need to be thinking, not we just have to come, but who's gonna lead this? What about me? Where could I take this? What if I got caught by a vision from God and I stepped up and made this thing move forward? What if it was me? Why not me? So in view of that, having spoken to those who are similar age to me and, and, and older, um, I want to show you a little video that kind of explains how you guys think a little bit to help all of us and then take it from, from there. Before we do that, um, something was said in the mid-1700s by William Wilberforce. Some of you know who William Wilberforce was. He was from Hull. But God saved him from Hull. <laughs> and um, he, of course, was the, the great force behind um, the, the abolition of slavery. Uh, not only in this country, but, but of course, the influence of that spread. And um, he said, I love this, he said to William Pitt the Younger, that's just, uh, every time I read that, I think that's just fab. I want to read that again. William Pitt the Younger, okay, that was his name, William, William Pitt the Younger. Uh, we are too young to realize that certain things are impossible, so we will do them anyway. That's a great statement. We are too young to realize that some things are impossible, so we'll do them anyway. That, that's the benefit of a young heart. It's the benefit of a young spirit. It's the benefit of a dream that is alive, that is able to say, we are too young to realize that certain things are impossible, so we'll do them anyway. And so I want to show you a video by a guy called Simon Sinek on YouTube, on Millennials in the Workplace, and then we'll talk for a few minutes after we've watched this video. It's 15 minutes, okay? Um, what's the millennial question? Apparently, millennials, as a generation, which is a group of people who were born approximately uh, 1984 and after, um, uh, are tough to manage. And they're accused of being entitled and narcissistic and self-interested, unfocused, lazy. <laughs> but entitled is the big one. And, uh, and because they confound leadership so much, what's happening is leaders are asking the millennials, what do you want? And millennials are saying, we want to work in a place with purpose, love that. Um, we want to make an impact, you know, whatever that means. Um, uh, we want free food and bean bags. Uh, and so somebody articulates some sort of purpose. There's lots of free food and there's bean bags. And yet, for some reason, they are still not happy. And that's because um, you, the, they're missing, there's, there's, a, there's a missing piece. Um, what I've learned is that there, I can break it down into four pieces. 
right? There are four, four things, four characteristics. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. The generation that we call the millennials, too many of them grew up um, subject to, not my words, failed parenting strategies, you know? Where, for example, they were told that they were special all the time. They were told that they could have anything they want in life just because they want it, right? They were told, um, uh, some of them got into um, honors classes not because they deserved it, but because their parents complained. And some of them got A's not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. Some kids got participation medals. They got a medal for coming in last, right? Which the science we know is pretty clear, which is it devalues the medal and the reward for those who actually work hard. And that actually makes the person who comes in last feel embarrassed because they know they didn't deserve it. So it actually makes them feel worse, mm. right? So you take this group of people, and they graduate school, and they get a job, and they're thrust into, an, into the real world. And in an instant, they find out they're not special. Their moms can't get them a promotion. Um, that you get nothing for coming in last. And by the way, you can't just have it because you want it. Right? And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation that's growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. The other problem to compound it is we're growing up in a Facebook, Instagram world. In other words, we're good at putting filters on things. We're good at showing people that life is amazing even though I'm depressed. Right? And so everybody sounds tough. And everybody sounds like they got it all figured out. And the reality is there's very little toughness, and most people don't have it figured out. And so when the more senior people say, well, what should we do? They sound like, this is what you got to do. And they have no clue. Right? <laughs> so you have an entire generation growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations, right? Through no fault of their own. Through no fault of their own, right? They were dealt a bad hand, right? Now let's add in technology. We know that engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. That's why when you get a text, it feels good, right? So you know, we've all had it where you're feeling a little bit down or feeling a bit lonely, and so you send out 10 texts to 10 friends, you know, hi, 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 because <laughs> it feels good when you get a response, right? right? It's why we count the likes, it's why we go back 10 times to see if, and if it's going, if our, my Instagram is growing slower, I, 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 did I do something wrong? Do they not like me anymore, right? The, the trauma for young kids to be unfriended, right? Because we know when you get it, you get a hit of dopamine, which feels good. It's why we like it, it's why we keep going back to it. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive. Right? We have age restrictions on smoking, gambling, and uh, alcohol, and we have no age restrictions on social media and cell phones, which is the equivalent of opening up the liquor cabinet and saying to our teenagers, hey, by the way, this adolescence thing, if it gets you down. <laughs> but that's basically what's happening. That's basically what's happening, right? That's basically what happened. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing, T chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones as they're going through the high stress of adolescence. Why is this important? Almost every alcoholic discovered alcohol when they were teenagers. When we're very, very young, the only approval we need is the approval of our parents. And as we go through adolescence, we make this transition where we now need the approval of our peers. Very frustrating for our parents, very important for us. It allows us to acculturate outside of our immediate families into the broader tribe. Right? It's a highly, highly stressful and anxious period of our lives, and we're supposed to learn to rely on our friends. Some people, quite by accident, discover alcohol and numbing effects of dopamine to help them cope with the stresses and anxieties of adolescence. Unfortunately, that becomes hardwired in their brains, and for the rest of their lives, when they suffer significant stress, they will not turn to a person, they will turn to the bottle. Social stress, financial stress, career stress, that's pretty much the primary reasons why an alcoholic drinks. Right? What's happening is because we're uh, allowing unfettered access to these dopamine producing devices and media, basically it's becoming hardwired. And what we're seeing is as they grow older, they, too many kids don't know how to form deep, meaningful relationships. Their words, not mine. They will admit that many of their friendships are superficial. They will admit that their friends, that they don't count on their friends, they don't rely on their friends, they have fun with their friends, 
But they also know that their friends will cancel on them as something better comes along. Deep, meaningful relationships are not there because they never practice the skill set. And worse, they don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person. They're turning to a device. They're turning to social media. They're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. Right? These things balanced. Alcohol is not bad. Too much alcohol is bad. Gambling is fun. Too much gambling is dangerous. Right? There's nothing wrong with social media and cell phones. It's the imbalance. Right? If you're sitting at dinner with your friends and you're texting somebody who's not there, that's a problem. That's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking and you put your phone on the table, face up or face down, I don't care, that sends a subconscious message to the room that you're, not just, you're just not that important to me right now. Right? That's what happens. And the fact that you cannot put it away is because you are addicted. Right? If you wake up and you check your phone before you say good morning to your girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse, you have an addiction. And like all addiction, in time, it'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. Right? So you have a generation growing up with lower self-esteem that doesn't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. Right? Now you add in the sense of impatience. Right? They've grown up in a world of instant gratification. You want to buy something? You go on Amazon, it arrives the next day. You want to watch a movie? Log on and watch a movie. You don't check movie times. You want to watch a TV show? Binge. You don't even have to wait week to week to week. Right? I know people who skip seasons just so they can binge at the end of the season. Right? <laughs> instant gratification. You want to go on a date? You don't even have to learn how to be like, Hey. <laughs> you don't even have to learn and practice that skill. You don't have to be the uncomfortable one who says, says yes when you mean no and says no when you mean no and yes when you... You don't have to swipe right. Bang, I'm a stud. <laughs> right? You don't even have to learn the social coping mechanisms. Right? Everything you want, you can have instantaneously. Everything you want, instant gratification. Except job satisfaction, and strength of relationships, there ain't no app for that. They are slow, meandering, uncomfortable, messy processes. And so I keep meeting these wonderful, fantastic, idealistic, hardworking, smart kids. They've just graduated school. They're in their entry level job. And I sit down with them and I go, How's it going? They go, I think I'm going to quit. I'm like, Why? They're like, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, You've been here eight months. <laughs> you know? It's as if they're standing at the foot of a mountain. And they have this abstract concept called impact that they want to have in the world, which is the summit. What they don't see is the mountain. I don't care if you go up the mountain quickly or slowly, but there's still a mountain. And so what this young generation needs to learn is patience. That some things that really, really matter, like love or job fulfillment, joy, love of life, self-confidence, a skill set, any of these things, all of these things take time. Sometimes you can expedite pieces of it, but the overall journey is arduous and long and difficult. And if you don't ask for help and learn that skill set, you will fall off the mountain. Or you will, the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, and we're already seeing it, the worst case scenario is we're seeing an increase in suicide rates. We're seeing an increase in this generation. We're seeing an increase in accidental deaths due to drug overdoses. We're seeing more and more kids drop out of school or take leaves of absence due to depression unheard of. These are all, this, is, th this is really bad. The best case scenario, the best, those are all bad cases, right? The best case scenario is you'll have an entire population growing up and going through life and just never really finding joy. They'll never really find deep, deep fulfillment in work or in life. They'll just, just waft through life and it'll be just, it's fine. How, how, how's your job? It's fine. It's the same as yesterday. How's your relationship? Eh, it's fine. Like that's, that's the best case scenario, which leads me to the, the fourth point, which is environment, which is we're taking this amazing group of young, fantastic kids who were just dealt a bad hand. It's no fault of their own. And we put them in corporate environments that care more about the numbers than they do about the kids. They care more about the short-term gains than the long-term life of this young human being. We care more about the year than the lifetime. Right? And so we are putting them in corporate environments that aren't helping them build their confidence, that aren't helping them learn the skills of cooperation, 
that aren't helping them overcome the challenges of a digital world and finding more balance, that isn't helping them overcome the need to have instant gratification and teach them the joys and impact and the fulfillment you get from working hard over on something for a long time that cannot be done in a month or even in a year. And so we're thrusting to them, them in corporate environments. And the worst part about it is they think it's them. They blame themselves. They, can't, they think it's them who can't deal. And so it makes it all worse. It's not. I'm here to tell them it's not them. It's the corporations. It's the corporate environments. It's the total lack of good leadership in our world today that is making them feel the way they do. They were dealt a bad hand. And, it's, and I hate to say it, but it's the company's responsibility. It sucks to be you. Like, we have no choice, right? This is what we got. And I wish that society and their parents did a better job. They didn't. So we're, gonna, we're getting them in our companies, and we now have to pick up the slack. We have to work extra hard to figure out the ways that we build their confidence. We have to work extra hard to find ways to teach them social, the social skills that they're missing out on. There should be no cell phones in conference rooms. None. Zero. And I don't mean the kind of like sitting outside waiting to text. I mean like when you're sitting and waiting for a meeting to start, nobody goes, this is what we all do. We all sit here and wait for the meeting to start. Meeting starting? OK. And we start the meeting. No, that's not how relationships are formed. Remember we talked about it's the little things? Relationships are formed this way. We're waiting for a meeting to start, and we go, how's your dad? I heard he was in the hospital. Oh, he's really good. Thanks for asking. He's actually at home now. Oh, I'm really glad. That was really amazing. I know. It was really scary for a while. That's how you form relationships. Hey, did you ever get that report done? Oh, my God. No, I didn't. I'll help you out. I totally I'll, can I help you out with that. Really? That's how trust forms. Trust doesn't form at an event in a day. Even bad times don't form trust immediately. It's the slow, steady consistency. And we have to create mechanisms where we allow for those little innocuous interactions to happen. But when we allow cell phones in conference rooms, we just, OK, have the meeting. And then my favorite is like when there's a cell phone there, and you go like this, you go. <laughs> it rings, and you go. I'm not going to answer that. But Mr. Magnanimous, you know? <laughs> when you're out for dinner with your friends, like, uh, I, I do this with my friends. When we're going out for dinner and we're leaving together, we'll, we'll leave our cell phones at home. Who are we calling? Maybe one of us will bring a phone in case we need to call an Uber or take a picture of our meal. That's what I was saying. Come on. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm an idealist, but I'm not insane. You know? <laughs> not a heathen. I mean, it looked really good. Um, we'll take one phone. And so it's like an alcoholic. The reason you take the alcohol out of the house is, be we, is because we cannot trust our willpower. We're just not strong enough. But when you remove the temptation, it actually makes it a lot easier. And so when you just say, don't check your phone, people literally will go like this. And somebody will go to the bathroom, and what's the first thing we do? Because <laughs> I wouldn't want to look around the restaurant for a minute and a half. you know. But if you don't have the phone, you just kind of enjoy the world. And that's where ideas happen. The constant, constant, constant engagement is not where you have innovation and ideas. Ideas happen when our minds wander and we go, and you see something, uh, I bet they could do that. That's called innovation, right? But we're taking away all those little moments, right? You should not, and none of us, none of us should charge our phones by our beds. We should be charging our phones in the living rooms, right? Remove the temptation. You wake up in the middle of the night because you can't sleep, you won't check your phone, which makes it worse. But if it's in the living room, it's relaxed, it's fine. I, I, uh, but it's my alarm clock. Buy an alarm clock. <laughs> it costs eight dollars. Right? I'll, I'll buy you an alarm. Clock. Isn't that great? Okay, so no. yeah, just check in. Siri, ask Siri a question. So we're living in a world, then, where friends are contacts on Facebook, and filters are a click away to block out anything we don't want to hear, and students creating, self -place, self, sorry, students creating safe places in our university debating rooms so that no one feels uncomfortable over anything which is done or said is not the pathway to the creation of a better or safer world. 
It's an avoidance of the issues we all have to wrestle with in the quest for love, fulfillment, joy, love of life, peace, confidence, deep meaningful relationships, friendships, and most of all for me, a faith that endures. It only allows us to wrestle at the superficial level with the what and the how of life rather than the why. I'm going to talk a lot more about that next week. Wrestling not with the what, not with the how. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? But the why of life. There are no participation medals given for life. You either win or you lose. Now there's grace in that and there's help, but there are no participation. Oh, well done. You were a person. You lived. Here's a medal. It's fine. You will either win or you will lose, which, if I might get a little spiritual, is why Jesus said, I came that you might have life in all its fullness. So if the journey is long, and difficult, which again is not the message we want to hear if we're millennials, because everything is instant gratification. If the journey is long and difficult, but achievable and possible, what is it that leads us to the place that we need to go? What's the ingredient that can take hold of that addicted, self-gratification, instant gratification thing, the thing that struggles with, with applying oneself, being consistent, being faithful, being loyal, pushing ahead, waiting, being patient, reaching out, seeing the dream and pursuing the dream. What is that ingredient that leads us to the place that we need to go? How many of you know Dr. Martin Luther King is? He, he is a hero of mine. I find it fascinating that, that probably the two most influential um, orators and leaders of our time are both black men, which is interesting because I'm so connected to the conversation going on in the US right now. One is Martin Luther King and the other one is Nelson Mandela. And the third probably strong influence that we often miss in the context of an influence on the world was a little four foot ten lady with a hunched back called Mother Teresa. How is a little lady four foot ten with a hunched back going to influence the world? Because of this ingredient that we're going to talk about and pursue a little more next week. In 1963, August 28th, 1963, 250,000 people gathered in Washington, D.C. for what was then the civil rights movement in the U.S. because although the emancipation of slaves had happened many years before under Abraham Lincoln, it was a facade. It was not entirely true. And unfortunately, and I argue this with my friends and one of my dearest friends in the U.S., um, is, 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 the, is the grandson of a former slave whose owner was so generous that when he emancipated the slaves, he gave them all a piece of land in Texas, which I think is so sweet because you hear all the other stuff, but this was really sweet. This man, when he understood what the problem was, gave land to his slaves. And my, my friend JL is, is, is a, a grandchild of, of those days. And back in the 60s, of course, uh, you know, if you were a black person, particularly in the South, you couldn't ride the same bus as a white person. You couldn't use the same public toilets. You couldn't shop in the same shops. You couldn't use the same restaurants. It, it was bad. But Martin Luther King was a man who, who rose up in that and became really a champion of, of the time. And um, he, there are two great speeches of Martin Luther King. One of them was a prophetic speech, which was actually the day before he died. He started talking about what really related to Moses in, in the children of Israel's journey, that I may not see the promised land, but I've been up the mountain and I've looked. And uh, the next day he was assassinated. That was one of his great speeches. The other great speech that is, is known all across the world was Martin Luther's great speech at this gathering of 250,000 people in Washington, D.C., 
August 28th, 1963, in black and white. He wasn't in black and white, but the, the, but the video's in black and white. And the speech lasted quite long, but this is the short version. And I want you to listen and see what you think is the prominent statement within what Martin Luther King said. So we're just going to run that. It's just a minute and 15. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creeds. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. So the question is, why and how did 250,000 people turn up on that day in Washington, D.C.? Because there was no tweet, no tweeting, no email, no Facebook, no Instagram. But 250,000 people, white and black, made the journey that day from all over the country to be in the presence of Martin Luther King as he presented the case for for liberty. There were other figures at the time who were active in the civil rights movement, and there were other good orators, but it was Martin Luther King. See, the issue is not examining what Martin Luther King said, but understanding the influence that he exerted. Because people felt, here's the word, inspired. People felt inspired. And whether you were black or white, whether you were old or young, wherever you came from, something happened when you came under that inspiration. The reason it was Martin is because through him people were inspired. But Martin Luther King did not develop the influence he exerted by saying, I have a plan. That's Baldrick of Blackadder, who had a cunning plan. But you see, having a plan does not produce inspiration. I want you to understand this. It's important for you as an individual. It's important for me as the leader. It's important for us as a church with the vision. Having a plan does not produce inspiration. If Martin Luther King had stood up that day and said, I have a plan, a cunning plan, I don't think that that would have led to the civil rights privileges that were obtained as a result of that meeting. He didn't say, I have a plan. He stood and said, I have a dream. And somehow people felt, because he had a dream, that they could be inspired to dream with him. If you have a plan, it's like, well, it's your business, you get on with it, and you know, here's the detail, we feel nothing, we just act, we just obey what we're told. But if you catch a dream, if you catch a dream, something inside of you becomes inspired. I have a dream, not I have a plan was his words, because inspired people change. And inspired people change their world. And inspired people change others. So what was the ingredient that we talked about? What, what's, that, what's that 
missing ingredient? What's that special thing that leads us to the place that we need to go? Even if it's long or difficult, it's inspiration, inspiration, inspiration. It's all about being inspired. Now, there's no magic formula to this. All I can say is that my desire above all else is that I can be an inspiration to you. So when you see me, when you hear me, when you're around me, whatever my personality is, which is, is pretty quiet and reserved, I'm, I'm a loner by nature, I, I, I'm shy underneath all this facade that finds its expression here. D despite all that, if, if I can be an inspiration to you, that, that my quest to know and be known by God gives me something of great value to share with you, and, and, and I can inspire you, that's the desire of my heart, because if you're inspired, you will change. If you're inspired, you will change your world. If you're inspired, you'll change others. It's a twofold contract. People came out that day because they were hungry for answers. Across the country there were riots, and Martin Luther King determined that he would have a non-violent protest. We face some issues in this city of of lies and innuendos and untruths that have been spoken about me and spoken about this church. But we have committed ourselves to non-violent protest. All that we are looking for is the same that these civil rights people were looking for, that we have a place where people can come together in brotherhood at the table and be one under the Spirit of Christ, that we love one another as he has loved us. And if you want to know about inspiration, the reason we sit here in 2016, when the one that we follow was hung on a cross in 30 AD, is because of the inspiration that touched people's lives. Jesus didn't come and say, I have a plan, a cunning plan. He came with a dream from the Father. He said, I'm going to build a group of people who the gates of hell couldn't even prevail against. And I'm going to give those people the keys of the kingdom, the way to make this work. I want to be an inspiring leader, and I want us to be an inspired people, because the best plan in the world won't change me, it won't change you, and it won't change our impact on our city. But our influence on our city will be affected by how inspired we are and how much we receive that. And if we do that, we are an unstoppable force. That just like what Jesus proclaimed cuts through the ages, that 2,000 years later still goes on, still changes life, still makes a difference. And in case you were wondering, abolition of slavery and emancipation and civil rights have all been a consequence of the inspired message of this man called Jesus. And I want us to be inspired. So I'm going to pick this up next week. I hope that's inspired you to be inspired enough to say, I'd like to be here next week. Because next week we're going to talk a little bit about this target circle of how at the center of all things has to be why. And that's why instant gratification doesn't fit with effective living. Because all instant gratification wants to know is what and how. But at the center of this is the why. And when we catch the why, the inspiration comes that we will make it to the mountaintop. We will make it into the land. So I bless you today in Jesus' name. I pray that your heart will come alive. I pray that your spirit will rise. I pray that you'll have hope. And I pray above all tonight that you'll begin to dream again. 
and that you will let those dreams be the inspiration for your life. Even if it's going to take you 20, 30, 40, 50 years to see that come to pass, you will let that dream be the inspiration of your life because it will sustain you and take you to where you need to go. So I bless you in Jesus' name and look forward to talking to you next week. All right, we're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.